spiritual storm had been brewing for several years in Germany. Albert Albrecht, in German, of Brandenburg, was elected Archbishop of Magdeburg when he was only 23 years of age. A year later, 1514, he bribed a rival to obtain the vacant Archbishopric of Mainz, which made him a member of that elite group of seven electors of the Holy Roman Empire, a most prestigious position, as well as being a very lucrative one because others would now come along and pay bribes to him to influence his vote. It was a clever power play by Albert. But there were problems. Because he was breaking so many rules, Albert needed to bribe Pope Leo X to confirm the three bishoprics he'd now picked up, Magdeburg, Halsperstadt, and Mainz. The Pope's men named their price as 12,000 ducats. Albert's people offered 7,000 ducats. They compromised and settled on 10,000. To guarantee that his money would be paid, the Pope granted Albrecht the right to sell indulgences, a kind of promissory note that reduced time in purgatory. They were to be sold on a sliding scale of amounts that could be adjusted to a purchaser's station in life, their income, the level of his or her sin. Half the collected funds went to Rome, the other half went to Albrecht. So, Pope Leo X got what he wanted, money for himself and funds to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Albrecht got what he wanted, money to pay off the debt with which his bribes had saddled him, control over the German church, and the position of the highest ranking dignitary, second only to the Pope, in the Holy Roman Empire. The German people got what they didn't want and didn't need, indulgences. The instructions given to the indulgence sellers declared that a plenary indulgence had been issued by His Holiness Pope Leo X. Subscribers would enjoy a plenary and perfect remission of all sins. They would be restored to the state of innocence, which they enjoyed in baptism, and would be relieved of all the pains of purgatory, including those incurred by an offence to the Divine Majesty. Albrecht's stooge, Johann Tetzel, didn't actually set foot in Saxony in order to sell his indulgences, but he came sufficiently close to the border of that territory to allow the people of Wittenberg to travel over, pay their money, and return with a pocket full of worthless promises. Tetzel's method was outrageous. He played on the fears of the simple people, who believed that their departed loved ones, a mother or father, husband or wife or child, were being punished in purgatory until someone still living would pay enough for their sin to allow them to transit to heaven. One of his catchy sales slogans went something like this. As soon as the gold in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Luther was incensed. The thought that a person could have their sins forgiven without conviction of sin or repentance, simply by paying a sum of money, was repugnant. To this man who had learned on his own quest to find peace of heart before God that the justified soul lives by faith and faith alone. Tetzel's doctrine of salvation by works was abhorrent to Luther because it was against Scripture. Luther sprang into action. He wrote the Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences, also known as the 95 Theses, a list of questions and propositions for discussion which on the 31st of October, 1517, he attached to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. The thesis set forward two central beliefs. One, that the Bible is the central spiritual authority. And two, we may reach salvation only by faith and not by our works. In a barbed assault on the scheme that the Pope and the Archbishop had concocted, Luther's 86th thesis asked why, Given the Pope's wealth, he wasn't using his own money to pay for St. Peter's rather than robbing poor believers. Thomas Carlyle, a historian who viewed Luther as one of history's heroes, called this expression of outrage by Luther a shout, and he wrote, The Pope should not have provoked that shout. It was the shout of the awakening of nations. By the beginning of 1518, copies of Luther's 95 Theses were to be found all over Germany. The relatively new medium of the printing press ensured this. They were to ignite the spark that fired the Protestant Reformation. 
They weren't new ideas. They had been advanced before. But Martin Luther codified them at a moment in history that was ripe for religious reformation. Bishop Albrecht received Luther's letter with his 95 arguments, but he didn't respond. Rather, he sent the document to Rome, requesting that Luther be prohibited from expanding on these ideas. Pope Leo X tried to ignore the controversy, and initially he dismissed Luther's actions in posting his theses as being nothing more than a monkish quarrel, a squabble confined to Wittenberg between squads of Augustinian and Dominican monks. But he soon woke up to what was really happening. He appointed a commission of inquiry under Dominican scholar Sylvester Mazzolini, a professor of theology. Professor Mazzolini did not know what he was getting into. He wrote a dialogue in Latin against Luther's theses, since the theses had been in Latin, but Luther simply dismissed it. And when Mazzolini tried again, Luther advised him not to make himself any more ridiculous by continuing to write. Every ounce of tolerance drained out of the Pope at this point. He summoned Luther to Rome to answer charges of heresy and rebellion against church authority. Leo X also demanded of Frederick the Wise, the Elector of Saxony, who was in charge of Wittenberg, where Luther was professor, that he should deliver up this child of the devil. Frederick the Wise, however, was quite impressed with Martin Luther, so he took up Luther's cause, and he arranged as an alternative an interview with the Pope's legate to Germany, Cardinal Cajetan at Augsburg. He also obtained a promise of kind treatment and safety. This debate descended into chaos. Cajetan, an Italian, branded Luther a deep-eyed German beast with strange speculations and told him never to enter his presence again unless he revoked his views. Then, as the next stage in the controversy, came the Leipzig Disputation. It's the month of June, 1519. 200 students from Wittenberg University are making their way over the river bridge and up to the castle gate at Leipzig accompanying two carts and armed with battle axes. Riding in one of the carts is Martin Luther, plus Philip Melanchthon and Andreas Karlstadt, the three main theologians from Wittenberg. They're on their way to debate with one of the leading theologians of the Catholic Church, Johann Eck. Originally, this debate in the impressive surroundings of the Pleissenburg Castle was to have been between Eck and Karlstadt and confined to the doctrines of free will and grace. But Eck invited Luther to join the debate and then expanded the terms of discussion that day to include live issues such as the existence of purgatory, the sale of indulgences, the need for and methods of penance, and the legitimacy or otherwise of the Pope's authority. Eck was clever. He carefully chose not to take on Luther on the issue of what the Bible said. Rather, he accused Luther of promoting the opinions of Jan Hus. And since Hus had been condemned by the Catholic Church 100 years before at the Council of Constance and then burned at the stake, Eck was warning Luther, you're lining yourself up alongside someone whom the Church has already condemned as a heretic. Note what could happen to you. Luther kept protesting that he was not like Hus, but Eck insisted. When the lunch break came, Luther made his way to the university library to read up on this Hus. He examined the record of the council. He discovered to his surprise that Eck was right. He was advocating the same position as Hus. Actually, he agreed with Hus on the major issues, such as the corrupting influence of indulgences, the need for the authority of Christ rather than the Pope, and the supremacy of Scripture. We are all who cites without knowing it, Luther mused. At the beginning of the afternoon session, in typical Luther style, because he never shied away from a bit of melodrama, he made this dramatic admission. Among the articles of Jan Hus, I find many which are plainly Christian and evangelical, which the universal church cannot condemn. Luther had started out by trying to reform the Catholic Church from the inside. But Eck had shown that day in debate and other times as well that Luther was promoting a position that the Church had condemned. The Church would not be changing. The situation was that the authority of the Church and the authority of the Scriptures were in direct competition. Luther had to choose between them. He did. He chose Scripture. 
And as he argued the point, he dropped this bombshell. A simple layman armed with scripture is to be believed above a pope or council without it. For the sake of scripture, we should reject pope and councils. Eck kept probing, continually bringing Luther back to the question of authority. Was it the scriptures or the pope? Are you the only one who knows anything, he asked Luther, except for you? Is all the church in error? With another flourish, Luther removed the need to debate any further. He said, I am a Christian theologian, and I am bound not only to assert, but to defend the truth with my blood and death. I want to believe freely and be a slave to the authority of no one, whether council, university, or pope. Luther left Leipzig through a hole in the wall where a horse was waiting for him. Then he rode for several hours back to Wittenberg. Eck traveled back to Rome to tell the Pope that Luther had admitted to being a Hussite. Luther was threatened with death, but he refused to back down. Two important results emerged from this debate in Leipzig. Luther gained even more followers, and many students left Leipzig where the debate had been held for the schools of Wittenberg. The pebble that was thrown into the moat of the Pleissenberg Castle that day came to be known by a Latin label, Sola Scriptura, Scripture Alone. And that would become one of the key slogans and be recognized as the formal principle of the Protestant Reformation. It would also be the rock under which the Roman Catholic Church would be crushed. Scripture alone, our ultimate authority. Alistair McGrath cuts to the chase of this controversy when he makes this conclusion. If the reformers dethroned the Pope, they enthroned Scripture. This was the last straw for Pope Leo X. Enraged, he sent a papal bull document to Luther. It was dated 15th of June, 1520, complete with the papal insignium. It gave him 60 days in which to recant of all of his errors. Otherwise, he would be cut off from the church and punished as an obstinate heretic. And it called for all princes, magistrates, and citizens to seize Luther and his followers, turn them over to the Pope, and burn all his writings. This bull took its first two words in Latin as its title. Exurge Domini, meaning arise, O Lord. And it continued with no small amount of irony and hypocrisy. Arise, O Lord, and judge thy cause. A wild boar has invaded thy vineyard. Arise, O Peter, and consider the case of the Holy Roman Church, the mother of all churches, consecrated by thy blood. Arise, O Paul. It would be interesting to see what the wild boar, mad monk, or child of the devil would do next. Next. 